Here's the second type of improper integral. The first type were examples where one of the bounds of integration, or both, were infinity. In other words, we were integrating over an infinite interval. The other category, this one, is when the function might have discontinuities along the interval where we're integrating. So somewhere in the interval from A to B, there can be a discontinuity, or multiple discontinuities, potentially. But as long as we can deal with one, we can deal with multiple ones as well by splitting it up into multiple pieces. So this, it turns out, we can divide into two categories where the discontinuity could occur at one of the boundaries of the interval at either A or B, meaning at either the lower or upper limit of integration. And for example, here I have the integral from 0 to 3 of 1 over x minus 3, which has a discontinuity at 3. If you try plugging in 3 for x, you'll end up dividing by 0. That function is undefined there. And on the other hand, we could have a discontinuity somewhere in between. So, for example, we have the integral from 1 to 5 of x over x minus 4 dx, and that has a discontinuity at x equals 4, because that would require you to divide by 0. So it's helpful to divide it into these two categories, because one helps us understand the other. And at this point, we can pause and recognize that now that we know that this can be an issue, whenever we run into a definite integral, it's important to pause for a minute and see if there are any discontinuities that we need to worry about. If, for instance, this integral was the integral from 5 to 10 of 1 over x minus 3, we wouldn't have to worry about a discontinuity at all, because although 1 exists, it's not on the interval that we're interested in if we were integrating from 5 to 10. But when we integrate from 0 to 3, or any interval that includes 3, that is an issue. So now that we have this knowledge, it gives us an extra step that we need to pause when we run into a definite integral and see if it happens to be improper. And if it does, we need to take care to deal with that discontinuity as we're going to show here. So just watch out for that when you run into examples. To actually do these integrals, we're going to take what we did with the infinite bounds and approach them the same way. In other words, visualize the interval from 0 to 3 here. That's where we're integrating. And the problem occurs here when x equals 3. There's a hole in the graph, a discontinuity where that function is not defined. So if we could take the integral from 0 to 2.9, for instance, and then take the integral from 0 to 2.99, and then from 0 to 2.999, we would observe a trend, and we'd be able to see if that integral, if the answers as the upper bound approaches 3, if those answers start to approach some value, and we would assume then that that would be the answer if we could integrate all the way to 3. So it's very similar to what we did with infinite bounds, where we set a variable upper bound, and then we let that bound approach the point at 3 that we're not allowed to actually reach. But we can watch as that limit approaches and observe what happens to the integral. So in other words, we change the 3 out for a t in this integral, and then take the limit as t approaches 3, and notice carefully that we're going to use a one-sided limit, so we'll approach 3 from the left. And if you haven't seen this notation in a little while, that negative superscript on the 3 means that we're just approaching from the left. We're not worried about what happens if t approaches 3 from the right, because the interval is from 0 to 3. So all we care about is what happens between 0 and 3, meaning on the left side of 3. If the integral was from 3 to 5, for instance, then we'd be interested in what happens on the right side of 3, and then we would take the limit as t approaches 3 from the right, using a plus instead of a minus to denote that. 
In practice, it doesn't change much about what we do. It just means that if we're going to evaluate this limit by testing points close to three, we would only test points that are close to three, but less than three. So 2.9, 2.99, 2.999, etc., not 3.01 or anything like it. So it's a subtle point, but notice that here in this case we're using one-sided limits. On the other hand, if we have a discontinuity between the bounds, so here we're integrating from 1 to 5, and at 4 is where we have this hole, this discontinuity. So we need to be careful approaching that from either side. So there's an issue on either side here. And we're going to do something similar to what we did, again, with the infinite bounds. When we needed two limits, like we do here, we need to approach four from both sides independently. We're going to, again, split this integral into two pieces. So this we would split into the integral, first of all, from one to four, and then the integral from four to five. And notice what we've done we've changed this problem where we have a discontinuity between our bounds of integration into one of this type where we have the problem at either the upper or lower bound of integration. So in other words we've taken a problem of type B and we've exchanged it for two problems of type A which is why we're thinking about these discontinuities in this way, organizing them into these two categories so that once we understand how to deal with a discontinuity at one endpoint, we can use that to figure out what to do with a discontinuity between the endpoints. So now we can rewrite this as a limit, replacing 4 with t, and taking the limit as t approaches 4 from the left. Notice that we're approaching here from the left. And then in the other integral, we again replace 4 with t. And we again have a limit as t approaches 4. But this time we're approaching 4 from the right side. So again, if we were going to evaluate that limit by plugging in points close to 4, we would plug in points slightly larger than 4. And on the first one, we would plug in values slightly smaller than four. So the first step with one of these improper integrals is to set up the limit form and then we would integrate as we've learned how to do plug in the limits of integration with t as a variable wherever necessary and then we have that last final step of evaluating the limit as t approaches whatever it needs to approach. So that's the general approach with a improper integral, and we'll see examples to follow.